You might wonder how an economist got involved with rammed earth. Well, I actually started out in 2009 and I fell down an earth cliff. And I fell 20 feet down and injured my, on a hiking trip and injured myself sufficiently that I had to then spend two months lying on my back. And I had nothing to do but just browse the web and look for interesting kinds of architecture. And even though I was a, an architecture student at the time, I had never heard of rammed earth, but I discovered it by, by two months of, of, um, of browsing the web. And I, when I came across rammed earth, I was stunned because it was so beautiful. And as I gradually learned, it had so many wonderful environmental properties that I had to ask myself, well, why have I never heard of this? I'm an architecture student. And why don't I see more of it around me in the world? Why isn't it used more? So that began the planning of this trip that my husband and I took to travel around the world to look at rammed earth and to talk particularly to those involved with building in it because I thought that's probably where the answers to the questions um, mostly lay. I looked at it and thought, well, it's easy to, to design beautifully in this material. For architects, it must be just a piece of cake, right? I realized that's not quite, I realized that's not quite as true as, as, as I thought. But that the real constraints lie and the real answers to the issues lie more with the builders. And so we started in Australia. And I was fortunate enough to meet at the very beginning of the trip um, Steve Dobson and uh, Rick Lindsay and talked to Giles Honan and who were very generous in their time with me and also in encouraging me that this, this journey I was on was not entirely crazy, that in fact they thought this was a worthwhile thing to embark on. There we go. And naturally, one of the places that we went to was, um, was Margaret River. And I see these houses not as being unexciting. I see these houses as being very exciting. And these were rammed earth houses that we were able to see as we were driving around the Margaret River, River area. They've been, there for, um, they've been there for some time. They're some of the first generation houses. You, but you can, this was in uh, 2010. And you can see they're all very well kept up. They're lovingly kept up, in fact. And, and what was great about them is that they're simple houses. Someone can look at this house and think, well, I could live in a house like that. It's not a mansion. It's not overly expensive. This is the kind of house I can aspire to live in. And the owners of the houses were, in fact, very proud of them. And they took us inside to show us what the insides looked like. And they all had the rammed earth coming all the way through the walls inside. And they, you could see how they were decorated and that hanging pictures on the rammed earth walls wasn't a problem and hanging baskets or anything else wasn't. And they, they were, this, to my mind, was about the best advertising you could do for rammed earth, was to have people that really loved, lived in their houses for a long time and really loved them. Naturally, we also went to some wineries on, the, on this trip, and, um, in, and starting with Cape Mantel, which was one of the first wineries on Margaret River, that was, and it was experimental at the time to use rammed earth for storing the wine and also for the wine um, tasting rooms, and very successful, and that led to its being used also in Lenten Bray and then um, across into, in the Mornington Peninsula area at the Moro, Moro Duck Estate. But what all of this was doing was building up, building up a familiarity, if you will, a recognition of rammed earth, so that people in the country knew what it was about and could imagine when they thought of building either a home or an office building or a winery, they could imagine thinking, well, maybe I should consider uh, using um, rammed earth. Now, this isn't true in the rest of the world. This is a good, this is the best part of this story in a sense. This is a rammed earth house. I, do I see any questions saying, no, that's not a rammed earth house, that's an adobe house, right? No, this is a rammed earth house in um, Las Cruces, New Mexico. And in spite of the fact that New Mexico has a very deep um, affection and deep cultural connection to earth building in the form of adobe, it's been very hard for rammed earth to get going there. 
And this surprised me for a long time. I couldn't think, I thought it must be the clay, right? Or it must be just, it must be something that's easily solvable. And no, the answer was, it's not the clay. It's that the people in New Mexico just really like the looks of adobe. And so this, a couple, the um, Pat Millis, uh, Balestri Martinez and her husband, about 30 years ago, realized how great rammed earth was, and especially in the southern part of the state where it's a hot and dry climate. And they decided that they would try to convince their clients to build in rammed earth. And they succeeded, and they, and they sold all the environmental properties and the, and the sustainability and the long lasting, but they couldn't convince them to build a house that looked like rammed earth. And so they, had, they would build a rammed earth house, and then they would cover it with the sort of plaster that's used to cover uh, adobe houses. And so it looks like an adobe house. And this is one of the reasons it's hard to find rammed earth houses in New Mexico as you travel around. It, um, but, um, but it's only part of it. And, and the, this real affinity towards adobe that, has, that permeates the state um, simply makes people that um, that live there think, well, why wouldn't I just live in Adobe? Another problem that has occurred is that there's very few uh, rammed earth builders in New Mexico. And I put this on the supply side. I, my, the paper that I produced for this conference looks at, <clears throat> at an economist's breakdown of demand and supply side. And the previous slide was really about, the previous two slides were about demand. You've got to recognize it. You've got to know what it is before you're going to be, have any demand for it. This, was, this is on the supply side and a problem on the supply side. In 2009, the Public Employees Retirement Association in Santa Fe, New Mexico, decided to build a, a, new, a new building for themselves but they wanted it to be a real landmark building and decided not to make it adobe, they were gonna make it rammed earth. But there aren't many rammed earth builders in New Mexico, you remember, and there weren't any large rammed earth builders. So the people they hired, they, um, the, the co contractor on it was Bob Lockwood, who was a major builder in Santa Fe, but he'd never, he'd never worked in rammed earth at all. And then they hired an architect from Phoenix that may have known something about rammed earth, but he was nine, 10 miles, nine, 10 hours drive away. And I don't think visited the site very much. And then, and then supposedly a consultant from New Mexico, a consultant in rammed earth that, and his input to the whole project, it remains a mystery. So the result was it, when the building was built in 2009, it was, it was perfect. It was lead gold certified. It won all sorts of building awards. And, and the um, para people were very pleased with it and were very proud of it. And then over the next two, three years, it started to erode. And you can see the erosion up under, around on the sign here. And it's, it started to erode on the southeast corner. And, and this, of course, and everyone just for a while just sort of looked at this and watched it and said, why is this happening? You know, because no one was really familiar enough with rammed earth to say, oh, yes, I don't. Well, the problem is this. So lawsuits flew back and forth for a while. And finally, it, um, the original contractor um, fixed it. And when we go back, we went back then to see it again in 2016. And you can see they, the same corners. It's, it's been fixed. Well, some of the problem was just, according to the contractor again, that the, um, the topping on, along the tops of the, of, of the walls was just simply inadequate, which was a design problem. And of course, the contractor said, well, they were all just design problems. Um, I'm sure the architect probably would say, well, they were all just you know, building you know, implementation problems. But the, the bad news is, the, the, the good news is the building was restored, and it's one against, once again lovely, and, uh, and sort of a landmark. But the bad, the bad part of it is that you never entirely restore the reputation that you had. This was an important 16,000 square foot building, an important building in New Mexico in rammed earth. And especially as my adobe friends in New Mexico are fond of, are fond of saying, Chisk, chisk, chisk. Isn't that a shame that that building, you know, that showed that rammed earth isn't reliable? 
Um, and so it just takes a long time to, rec to recover and <laughs> to create that reputation and that to cr create this. So this building is adding to that demand side of the equation that more people want to want to build in this. Next, we're going to Germany. On this trip around the world, my husband and I went to Australia, around through Asia, Germany, um, Europe, um, around various places. And I'm going to take you just, given the limited time, I'm not going to take you through the, my demand supply analysis. I'm just going to take you to some sort of some highlight place, places that we went that I think give you, that have something special to say or say something anyway, something special that we learned uh, in, in the process. You all recognize the Chapel of, of Reconciliation in, in Germany, um, completed in the year 2000. One of the surprising things to me is that since 2000, given how popular this building is, since 2000, there has been, from what I've been able to figure out, and I've talked to Jomo about, about this some as, as well, but there hasn't been much rammed earth building in Germany since then. There are a couple um, internal walls that Minky references in one of his books, one on a youth center um, and another inside a chapel, inside a hospital. Um, but you would have thought that there would have been much more of a takeoff from this. Or my, Anyway, my theory of demand would tell you there that this would be you know, a real impetus to more building in earth um, in, in Germany. But what we did discover is that the earth building has, to some extent, taken a different form. This is an earth, build, an earth building materials factory in Rheinheim, Rheinheim Germany. And we visited um, the owner of this factory. There are three factories in Germany that build, that make earth building materials. And these consist of clay panels, clay bricks, clay plasters, um, anything that you can pretty much think of, um, clay paint, uh, that are made out of natural materials. And there, um, and they have, this was again, this was probably 20, 2011 or 2012. They have um, a very good business, but they said most of their business is selling not to people who are building new houses, but rather people who are remodeling houses. And partly this was a was said to be that it's easier to get a building permit to remodel a house than it is to get a, a building permit to build an entirely new structure. So that there was just a lot more remodeling business generally um, in, in, the, in, this, in this particular uh, field and, for, and type of product. We were fortunate to visit uh, with some people outside of, of Munich who were in fact renovating their house using earth products. They had taken the house, they loved the lines of the house, and they decided, they considered building in rammed earth, but instead they decided that they would just strip the house down and rebuild it with earth products, make it in fact an earth house. And they stripped it all the way down so the only thing left was this, were the wooden studs. And that they then rebuild it using um, clay bricks that they had, to, this was a very, very labor intensive endeavor. They had to cut the clay bricks um, by hand to the lengths that they wanted. They used clay panels for inside and all sorts of clay plasters um, which required putting on in many layers thick up inside, inside the house. And the house was almost done by the time we were there and it was lovely and it was very cool and calm and peaceful the way you think about rammed earth buildings being. It felt like a rammed earth building. It was an earth building but it had just been put together um, very, very differently. Next, we're going to Bhutan, a little bit of a jump. Um, and Bhutan is one of the examples where rammed earth has, in fact, been is successful not only historically, being the main vernacular building material and historically in the, in the country, but it's also still the major building material in the country. And this is an exception for, um, in, for most developing countries. The reasons behind this, and, and a major reason, is the government's policy of, of that the country would gradually open up to the outside world, but would preserve its culture and its resources in the process of doing this. 
And part of preserving that culture has been to preserve rammed earth building. You can see the, the rice paddy here, and you can see these are rammed earth houses in the background. Um, and part, the tradition of Bhutan also includes lots of monasteries and, um, and temples. These were young boys just sitting. They were actually laughing together over something. I'm not sure what, but I thought the picture was a charming example of the, of the, um, of the culture. We came across a man, Mr. Dom Cho, who was building his fifth Ramdur's house. And we asked, fifth Ramdur's house, wow, you must be a builder. And he said, no, I'm not a builder. I just said, this is, I'm on my fifth wife and I have to build a new, a new house for each of my wives. So I have to, this is my fifth Ramdur's house. But he obviously had, um, was quite experienced at it. And he gave us, <laughs> He gave us a tour of his house, including going up this, climb, we climbed up this ladder into the, um, into the upstairs. And he was, he was very knowledgeable and also very proud of his house. His house uses no cement. Um, it uses no lime except for an outside, the very outside layer of protection after the layer of dung and, and the painting basically layer goes on our painting equivalent. Everything is done by hand. All the tool, the only tool is this little, there's a small knife that this man has, and he has cut out every piece of wood. He has cut out all the intricate um, decorations around the window. Um, he cut out the ladder from a log. Um, and so, it, again, it's, it's very, um, it's very labor intensive, but the way the CIS building system works is that when someone needs a, when someone gets another wife and needs another, another house, the neighbors all get together and help them build it. So he had up to 300 people, 300 rice farmers working with him at some point, and they will come when the, when they can leave the fields, either between rice harvest or after it's been planted and, and they have some time off, and they all work very intensively together. And then, and then they go back to their work in the rice fields. Um, but it had taken him, I think, some two months to get these walls erected, which is pretty, which is pretty amazing considering how much hand work is involved. You can see the sort of tampers that they have here. He was showing us that this is what they use to ram, to ram the earth. Um, it's an earthquake um, area, of course. Um, and in Peru, isn't as bad as in some parts of the countries. But we asked him, okay, why are you building in rammed earth? Your choices, you could build in brick. And, um, or what about wood? And he said, well, we don't build in wood because the government wants to preserve the forests. And therefore, we are very careful about the amount of wood that we use. In fact, the house will be heated by electricity because the government doesn't want us to build to burn wood um, and, and, and um, adversely uh, affect the, the forests. Um, but he also said, I could have built in brick, but brick isn't stable enough. Brick, uh, brick walls in a, a house in town broke after just a few years. And rammed earth is much more stable, including in the country, uh, this country that is prone to earthquakes. He said in the corners, the one thing he does is in the corners, he, they don't do the seams straight up. They, they um, set, the seams are set off so that, uh, so any sort of pressures will not be, uh, earthquake pressures will not be um, directly trans transmitted down a seam. But um, as I said, no, no cement and no, um, and no lime. But in the end, he said, the reason why I built this house is because it is our culture. Rammed earth is our culture. And this is when you, I come back to my issues in demand and what makes, um, what makes for strong, strong demand in some places for rammed earth and, and not in others. Culture is just such a major factor. It's like what you saw in New Mexico that um, it's just, rammed earth just isn't, the local culture. But in, in some places where it is a local culture, then the government has a big role 
in trying to maintain that and trying to support that, just as the government in Bhutan has done, partly because to support and, main, and um, preserve the culture, but also to partly to preserve the natural resources of the country. We're going next to China. Another um, small jump. And when we were in China, we met uh, Professor Hu Rong Rong, who spoke at the Perth conference here that some of you may have attended a couple of years ago. And, and, um, and we learned of her, of her work in the rural villages in China and trying to convince people in rural China that, th that they should adapt, um, adopt modern rammed earth as housing um, rather than brick or concrete block or something, or something else, and the and the uh, tough job she had selling modern rammed earth, simply because it was considered to be the housing of the poor. It was a poor rural housing, and people would do anything. They would live in something that was more expensive and less comfortable, as long as they didn't look like they were poor, because they were in earth building. Um, and then we met uh, at, at Rong Rong's suggestion in, in an introduction. Um, we met Mr. Ren Wei Xiong um, outside of um, about three hours outside of Shanghai in the um, area of, called Anji. It's it's three hours outside of Shanghai. You aren't really outside of the city yet. You're in the suburbs, and you can see the typical housing. This is the sort of housing that existed in the area around. Brick housing um, subsidized or built by, the, built by the government. This is the alternative that people had there. Well, Mr. Wren had studied housing, and, and Mr. Wren Mr. Wren is really a one-man environmental movement. It's the only way to really describe him. He decided that rammed earth was the way to go for, for housing in China. And he had tried to convince his neighbors of that, the neighboring farmers that were gradually moving into their, from their farms into, into this um, alternative housing. So Mr. Wren studied rammed earth, and he built his own rammed earth house, which we had a tour of. And it's a lovely house, and it's very solidly made. He didn't use any cement in it. He used uh, 6 to 7% lime. Um, and it's very solid, and it's very comfortable, and it had all sorts of mod all the modern conveniences. But he said he tried to convince his neighbors that they should, you know, that they should look at this. And even the fact that his house costs half as much as these houses costs, the neighbors weren't interested. It was still earth. It was still earth building, and. So then, Mr. Wren is not easily discouraged. So then, Mr. Wren set up a center for popularizing ecological housing, of which he is the chief, and sort of and the only, <laughs> and, and the only employee. Um, I shouldn't say that. He has a couple of uh, he has a couple of assistants that have helped him do the building. And then he also built another house. He built built this house, a separate building for this center for ecological housing in in Earth Building, and he built this uh, classroom because he is prepared for people to really finally understand and to come to his, his um, center and finally learn how to build in rammed earth. And he is, he is determined that the people will eventually um, understand this. But he has, he's had a hard time, partly because of lack of public support, which I mentioned before, government support and how important it is. Uh, and lack of public support, and, and just when all the, the local political parties, I'm sure, are saying, oh, this is great housing over here, you should, you know, that's what you should go live in. It doesn't matter that his housing is um, more comfortable, costs half as much, um, and is ecologically sound, it's still, very, it's still a very hard sell to me. So finally, we're going all the way back to the U.S. and because um, and I, I want to talk about um, precast 
and prefab rammed earth because for a long time I thought this has got to be the future of the industry. It's got so many things to offer and so many things to offer on both the demand and supply sides um, of the market. This is uh, from David Easton's um, uh, shop in Napa, California. And we were there in uh, March of, or February of 2016. And he was ramming this, whoops, whoops, wrong one. And he was ramming this panel that you see, you see, they, he is not as mechanized as Martin uh, Rausch, but he is, um, but he has, so he doesn't have a mechanized um, ramming system, but he has a system whereby the, um, the rammer moves back and forth, it's moved back and forth alongside the panel. So, um, and that's what was going on here. This was, this panel, which ended up being the panel over on, on um, this side of the screen, this is what it ended up looking like. Uh, it's 20 feet high, it's 24 feet long, and it's three or four inches deep, um, thick. And <coughs> David has moved into, only moved into um, prefabricated rammed earth in the last three or four years, but he has become a real convert to it because he has seen the incredible things that can be done. In this, for, um, in this sort of case, I would, this is not going to be structural. This is more what I would call artistic. Artistic and um, air, air um, humidity modulation. This is where the panel was installed in an office building. And can you imagine walking into, this is the, um, the, the entrance to the office building, and can you imagine walking in and seeing this? as a selling point for rammed earth people. And I, so one of the things I think about, I think is so great about prefab is that it will allow new products to be made and rammed earth to be seen in places where it never was seen before. And it also, of course, on the supply side, and Rick Lindsay has done, has been doing this for uh, a number of years. It also allows, allows you to build in places that would be too expensive to build if you had to actually do the ramming on the site. You can precast even in the outdoors on another site and just lift the um, precast panel into place where you couldn't, it wouldn't pay to set up um, a whole work site around just the small, I think it was a, uh, for a town, um, an, an entry sign for, for a town. So for both the demand and supply side, I think precast has, has an awful lot to, um, to offer. And it takes us back to that first, the first little rammed earth houses in Margaret River. It's all about getting it out in front of the people to see and letting them know what rammed earth is. And I think there's a tremendous demand, potential demand and tremendous market for rammed earth um, if we just, if we keep those, those things in mind. My paper also goes into, I've talked mostly about the demand side. My paper goes as a, as a supply side to it as well. I'm not just a demand side economist. Um, but um, I, for, given the lack of um, or constraints on time, I'm, I'm not going to go into that. I know the builders here in the audience know what a lot of those are. It's the issue of labor cost and mechanization and just how mechanized do you want to become and how mechanized can you afford to be and issues of on-site um, production and how do you, how do you manage that. An another one that I think is so important is what is your, um, what's your business plan and how do you see yourself expanding? Because rammed earth isn't the easiest uh, industry or kind of building firm in, in the world to expand. You can get up to the limits of the, of the one owner um, model and then what you do, how he can now, the owners can only be spread so thin. And how do you then plan to expand from there? Um, and that's, I think, that's a big issue that, um, that Rick Lindsay, for example, faced by splitting his firm up into um, parts that were owned by people that used to be the foreman on his, um, on his projects, which I think is a great model. Um, it's not an easy model for people in the U, for the people in the U.S. have not done, builders in the U.S. haven't done all that well, I think, at, 
at taking that on. Um, I think, again, Europe has done better um, with any place that has apprenticeship programs where you can tr do on-the-job training for, um, for the people that will be doing the rammed earth um, have, uh, have a tremendous advantage. Apprenticeship programs, are, the U.S., just not in the U.S. psyche for some reason to use apprenticeships very often. And so the one rammed earth builder that I talked to who had hired apprentices said, yes, well, I had a couple apprentices and then they left and set up their own firms and competed with me. So I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> um, and so you have to have, I think, for the whole round earth industry to flourish, you have to have an attitude that it's not just your firm. It has to be the whole industry. It has to be all of you together. And if, so if somebody sets up a competing firm, well, that's just more supply on the market. And that's just better for, um, for everybody and you'll learn from each other, including in, in wonderful workshops like, um, like this is. Thank you.